So hi, good morning everybody. My name is Maddie and I'm an English major with KHC and my project is titled Whose Fatal Scroll? The Depiction of Voice and the Development of Blakeian Gothic in Poetical Sketches. So the Blakeian in my title comes from this guy over here uh, who's William Blake. He's the first and oldest of the British Romantic poets in the 18th century. The big six of this time period include him, Coleridge, Wordsworth, Keats, Byron, and Shelley. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that we're looking at today. And Poetical Sketches was the name of his first book, which he published in 1783. And all of the material in it was written when he was around the ages of 12 to 20. And he published the whole thing when he was 26. So he made his debut into the world of poetry when he was about my age. And my question began as, how did Blake consider the role of the poet in these early years? How did he think about the purpose of poetry? And the way I went about answering that question was by balancing biographical and historical information with literary criticism, primary documents, and the poems themselves through close reading. So a brief biography for you guys, just to get some context. Blake was born in 1757, which was a period of rapid growth for England. The population in London was increasing. The Industrial Revolution was getting started. So the city limits were extraordinarily busy. It was a real mixing pot of people. And he lived in a very interesting mixed society. He also had a very personal relationship with death from a very young age. His house was actually built on a filled in burial ground. And the burial ground to replace that one was behind his house. And the smell of rotting flesh was so strong and so bad that the neighbors actually complained to the city that, wow, this is awful. So uh, it's an interesting environment to grow up in, but he was a really interesting kid himself. Uh, he had visions of angels and God speaking to him um, from a very young age. He didn't make a lot of friends. He liked to wander the countryside um, instead by himself. He was very isolate. So uh, he was very, he was, a, he was an isolate, solitary character, very interesting. And he was also very artistic from an early age. So he was encouraged by both of his parents to develop that artistic talent that he had. And when he was about 10, he enrolled in drawing school where he exhibited very classical tastes for uh, Michelangelo, you know, the old Italian masters. And he soon began an apprenticeship with an engraver for the Society of Antiquaries, where among his duties were sketching these old Gothic tombs and monuments of English history of the past. And that had a very strong influence on him as a child. And soon after that, he entered his apprenticeship with a copy engraver. So he was doing a lot of sketching and printing of those sketches that he made. And he was admitted to the Royal Academy of Art, which was the most prestigious art school that you could go to at the time. But a year later, after that, he stops attending his classes for some reason. He gets very involved in political activism. He attends a bunch of anti-Catholic protests. Um, he, within the span of two years, he meets and marries his eventual wife, Catherine, who is an illiterate woman. And the year after that, he publishes a book of poetry, which was very out of character for him. But a year later, he opens his own print shop, going back to that artistic training that he's comfortable with. Um, so this period of years between 1780 and 1783 is this really exceptional period devoted to this resistance of fashionable artistic ideals that he was exposed to at the Royal Academy. And instead, this out of character exploration of expression through the written word was prioritized. So what does poetical sketches actually look like? Uh, it's 27 poems total, but I use the word poems like very loosely. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things going on here. There's lyric poems, ballads, and even prose that's all mixed in here together. Um, but there's absolutely zero visual art, which was out of character for somebody who was classically trained in visual art. Um, there are decorative ornaments that separate the pieces, but front and center is this mixture of tones and themes that Blake explores in the book. And the most striking of those that I think is the influence of this Gothic aesthetic. But what do I mean when I say Gothic? Well, I'm going to show you. This is an excerpt of a poem called Fair Eleanor that he wrote when he was about 15-ish, we think. Uh, and the basic premise is that Eleanor, this young woman, is wandering around her castle at like 1 in the morning. It's dark. There's a thunderstorm happening. She's hearing like ghosts wailing in the distance. 
and a man comes running at her and shoves this clothed bundle into her hands and she takes it back to her bedroom. And this is what happens. Uh, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but the first stanza, her eyes were fixed, the bloody cloth unfolds, disclosing to her sight the murdered head of her dear Lord, all ghastly pale, clotted with gory blood, it groaned and thus it spake. So this is kind of a disturbing image to come from such a young person um, and highly unusual in terms of poetic convention. Um, Gothic literature has only really just started to come about since 1764. So this is like 20 years after it debuted, so to speak. And really only in novels at this time period, like Dracula is 110 years off from this. Frankenstein is 30 years off. So it's very new and for poetry, it's really unusual. Um, the goal with it though, was to tap into this darker psyche of humanity, like the, the terrible hidden things that we don't speak of in everyday life. And we see these themes of the supernatural reflected in Fair Eleanor. So I used Fair Eleanor as the centerpiece for this project because a few key themes that come up are repeated throughout, I noticed. Uh, so the first one of that is the disembodied voice and performative speech, the literal talking ahead that reveals something true and unknown about the universe. Um, the second one is the reverence for the past. So this head that speaks to us is dead. It's from the realm of the dead and what is past in the past. And lyricism coming from madness. So this whole scene is overshadowed by this sense of terror and hysteria. And from that place comes beautiful poetry or meaning. And I was able to trace those themes through 11 more pieces in the volume. So 12 of the 27 total, which actually constitutes a majority of the page count of poetical sketches, even though it's not a majority of the number of poems themselves. So this is clearly, these themes are clearly important to Blake in this time period. And so they're worth looking at. And so what we can draw from analyzing poems with the same themes in Fair Eleanor is that Blake is portraying darkness not as something that hides the darkness of humanity, which is the most common interpretation of Gothic trope in literature. He actually turns the trope on its head. In the dark, we, like Eleanor, the woman in the poem, are disconnected from the corrupt and modern society that we're able to perceive through our senses and instead enter this realm of the dead um, sh shrouded in darkness and the art that unlocks that unique, unknowable experience is the very best kind. And so poetical sketches in this way is kind of a statement about retreating into the boundlessness of imagination in order to express the whole of human existence. Um, this is not really something that's been done before at this point in literary history. It's still highly unusual today. The Gothic is kind of like a, here's what it's used for and it's kind of only used that way. Um, but it really set the tone for work um, of the later romantic poets. And so Blake in this way still remains a visionary and kind of central figure for this period of literary history and the history of poetry, even as a young man. So um, I can take questions now if we're all good. I'm gonna leave this slide up though. Yeah. Um, did you find any evidence of any other artists or works that may have influenced him like earlier on? Just because he developed this so unique like style of writing. Um, yeah, he artists? had a lot of um, poets that influenced him, uh, Gray and Collins, and um, but not in the the sense of the Gothic, the sense that was most important to me. And I think that's what struck me as so odd about it was that it doesn't show up before him, really, um, as far as I can tell. So he kind of seemed to just, I, th I think it stems from this um, prolonged time that he spent with uh, looking at the Gothic architecture in England for so long. He would spend hours, you know, staring at these monuments that are kind of creepy to look at. So uh, I think it really did impact the kind of aesthetic that he developed in his mind of his nation. Yeah. Did you um, study any 
thinking of Blake's relationship with like religion and what some of the theology that he was mixed up in, or especially because if you're in England and you're looking at these Gothic um, monuments and other things too, you think of cathedrals and other structures like that. So was religion a part of this too, or? Um, I think his preoccupation with um, the delivery of voice and the role that darkness plays in that is less connected to religion. Um, he did have a, an interesting religious background. His parents were both dissenters. Um, and the political protests that I mentioned earlier that he was a part of, he uh, was anti-institutionalized religion. Uh, he had a big problem with Catholicism, but he himself never attended church, really. He was, um, he developed a lot of private theology later in his life. Uh, he would write these huge manifestos on it. Um, but I think at this point in his life, it's playing religion plays less of a role than how do I express myself. I think this was mostly a, an exercise in self-expression. Mm -hmm. looking to tying any of this with his art, which is also very striking. I, I was interested in that. Um, most of his, as I said, this is a period of time where he kind of abandons visual art and instead prioritizes this written word. Um, so I thought that itself was a statement that there is no art going on at this time period. Um, as far as the stuff that he does later, I haven't really looked into that yet. It was kind of beyond the scope of my project, um, but I'm sure there is lasting impacts. I know for a fact that when he was doing this writing exercise, he was also practicing um, what came to be known as mirror writing, which he became famous for, which is he would write backwards and then print it in his handwriting so that instead of like set type, it would be uh, printed handwriting which he became kind of famous for. That was like a new technique that he invented. So I know that was being developed at this time, but uh, as part of this, how do I express myself through writing kind of exercise? But uh, I don't really know as far as the actual printing goes. Okay, I think that's it.